Hello. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the session of uh, British Business uh, Group Pune. Uh, we, I now present the stage to Mr. Ram Gopal Rao to take up the welcome remarks. Uh, dear BBG members and General Bali, it's a pleasure to have you all on this online, you know, the second event for this month. Uh, uh, and uh, it would be my pleasure to introduce General Bali whom I've known for the last five years. Uh, uh, I will give a very brief uh, 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 synopsis of his career. Uh, he is retired from the Indian Army as a Major General, and he was connected with the Indian Army for 41 years and retired in 2016. Uh, during his career, he has held many important positions, and uh, he was uh, specially awarded the Sena Medal for Gallantry and the chief of the army's commendation twice, both times for service in JNK. He has also served abroad. He has been on deputations as well as he was part of the first Indo-US exercise at the strategic level and was appointed as a mentor to both the US and the Indian brigades. Later, he served in Lesotho in Southern Africa, security advisor to the government and leader of the Indian army training team. Uh, his last post posting was as uh, the, the GOC Southern Maharashtra, which means it's an army establishment where he's in fully charge of all the depots, ammunition, uh, dams, hospitals, cantonments in 18 districts of the state of Maharashtra. Apart from uh, his uh, uh, illustrious career, he's also academically he, he has uh, an MSc and MPhil in Defense Studies, and he also did a study program in the US at the Asia Pacific Center of Security Studies in Hawaii. After his uh, 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 retirement, General Bali has taken on the altar of, uh, of a person who really uh, is, uh, you know, is into uh, uh, leadership, uh, uh, issues. He's uh, the founder of Leakscape Advisors, which is a consulting firm based on disruption, organization, culture, and leadership. So he, he has, in the last few uh, years, organized and and been uh, has spoken at various gatherings, including the Indian Institute of Management, Ahmedabad, XLRI, Jamshedpur. And he has addressed professionals in summits in the U.S. and Portugal. He has talked uh, at the, in the Tata group of companies, as also with Wipro. Uh, he has be, uh, interacted with POC heads at MDI and has also been connected with two summits of the Institute of Chartered Accountants of India. He's also a ICF certified life and leadership coach. And of course, I had the pleasure of meeting him five years ago, as I mentioned. And and I really admire him for the way, for his articulation. So we have a great speaker today where he's going to talk about winning in the age of disruption. He will bring to life what he has learned and how can that be uh, converted into the corporate world is what he's going to talk. So over to you, General Bali. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm about to share my screen. I hope you can see me. I can see yeah. myself. But that may not be good enough. Uh, just a moment. So I'm just sharing it. All right. I presume you can see the first slide, which says the age of disruption lessons from the army. All right. If you can, I presume you can see it. So I will uh, start from here. See, it's obvious that we're all going through pretty strange and some would say scary times. There is a great deal of anxiety, uncertainty, even ambiguity in our minds about how life is going to be after the cloud of Corona has passed. Uh, no one should be able to give you that answer with any certainty, but I suppose we know a broad framework. What I'm going to talk about today is not just about the uncertainty caused by coronavirus, but also how disruptive moments in our life uh, can affect us and what can we learn from an organization which is perpetually dealing with uncertainty. First of all, let me get the COVID-19 out of the way by saying, where are we headed? Now, if I had any 
sense, I would say I don't know. Uh, but I'm going to give a few answers based on what everyone has learned over the last five months. One of the first things is that I think globalization, how will it proceed? Uh, definitely the jury is out on that. Uh, there was a lot of talk in Western nations about big government not being relevant. As you know, Mr. Reagan said, uh, government is not the solution, government is the problem. But I'm afraid even that has been stood on its head because without the government, when you are faced with a pandemic like this, you really can't do very much. There is a lot of talk that we are going to be short of demand and therefore a lot of money is required in the economy. But I think the problem is not just demand side, it's also the supply side because many chains are broken and a lot of work will be needed before we can get them in place. There has already been a 20,000 lakh crore rupees of worth of, um, well, some people call it stimulus, but I think more money will come in and probably the uh, infrastructure and healthcare sectors would stand to benefit. And of course, in our lives, as in the life of all businessmen, cash will definitely be the king for the few years to come. Okay, now again, my slide has frozen. So I'll have to just check again what to do about this. Yeah, okay, it works. Now, having said that, I don't think there is uh, all gloom and doom because we have a very large population. We are able to consume whatever we manufacture. We are not so much uh, uh, dependent on exports. So I think economy, I'm not an economist, but I think economy will sooner or later find its feet. Uh, social distancing will remain a norm, which will cost a lot of shadow on our lives. Uh, remote functioning, irrespective of uh, what happens, I think will become also a norm in many cases. The word I hear all the time is hybrid, which means whether it's schools, colleges, or any other organizations, we will have both an online component and an, off and an offline component. There is a great deal of excitement about IT being the next king because everybody needs IT now and everybody needs to be online. But I think IT will be profitable only where, where it is involved with profitable sectors. So if it is in, say, food retail, obviously IT will do well, but IT will not do well uh, just because it is IT. And finally, those of you who are in the selling business, I'm sure you understand that now only mission critical products will work. You just can't sell anyone. In fact, I read somewhere that uh, people now require only painkillers. They don't require vitamins. That <laughs> All right. If this is where we had it, what are we going to talk about today? Three things. I'm first of all going to talk about how is army qualified to talk about all this disruption and uncertainty. What is this fog of war that uh, that we uh, you know uh, that qualifies us to deal with disruption all the time? Second is what really causes disruption in our lives. It isn't just Corona. I'm going to give you four fascinating uh, different things. And finally, of course, we'll talk about three lessons from the armed forces or the army in particular. I first want to tell you about fog of war. So this is a real map and this is a real situation. This is back in 1998. I was the commanding officer of a anti-terrorist battalion, one of these Rashtriya Rifles battalion. On top, top of the map where you see the headquarter written is a village called Patahiri where my headquarter was. And I had sent out uh, a small party for an ambush in this area on a Nala. We used to send this ambush very often because there was talk about militants coming down from top and going into the jungles below. So this ambush had been in place for many, many days. It used to, every day we used to lift it and at night we used to put it back, but nothing really used to happen. One day when I was in the mess at about 10, 10, 30, I heard a lot of AK-47s opening up. It was clear to me that the ambush had finally started firing. I spoke to the JCO there and he said, sir, we have fired a lot of rounds, but I'm not sure who we have fired at because I don't think we drew any fire. We have shot some people in the fields across, and uh, I'm very fearful that we may have shot civilians. So I said, all right, I will take a small party and then come and join you. So please don't fire anymore when I, when I come through this little nala here, I'll walk here. So I took this route and, uh, sorry, this is again freezing. Okay, this was the ambush. And this was the route I took finally to reach this JCO, along with one more officer and a doctor. And sure enough, when we reached there, it was pitch dark. You couldn't see a thing. There were waterlogged fields on the other side. And all you could...
things do is wait for the morning because if you tried crossing the nala you could easily get shot by somebody who was still lying in wait so as the night passed my officers got a, my officer got a little more confident and just before dawn he started joking with me and said he said sir you're going to be famous tomorrow you will be in times of india for all the wrong reasons and uh, finally the dawn broke and we went across and we shot, saw that we had shot five pakistani terrorists all carrying weapons so it ended well but i just want you to understand this is just one operation not even a celebrated operation and this is the kind of uncertainty this is the kind of fog this is the kind of disruption that people who operate face all the time the lesson out of this is not that uh, it's it's tough to operate like this of course it is the lesson is how do you prepare for these situations which you don't know will occur how do you get ready for it and therein lies the lesson for everybody on how to prepare for disruption so there are four things that cause disruption i'm going to take this triangle going from bottom to top and each one of them believe me is very fascinating and you need to pay attention the first thing that tends to cause disruption in our life is not technology itself but it is how it is exploited how it is used now you might say this is a strange picture to start with a kirana store a mom and pop store we are all familiar with this uh, now these kirana store have been you know they've been all pervasive they're all over india they are permanent feature of our lives but they pose no threat to anybody else that's why they have existed because they are outside the domain of uh, digitize digitalization they don't have the breadth of that the stores nor do they have the depth of the inventory that they can cause any flutter to say big bazaar or reliance retail or you know one of the biggest stores and i'm sure all of us are familiar with having gone to these stores and saying i need a kg of sugar and i need two packets of britannia biscuits and you got it so you didn't have to travel far but all that is about to change i'm sure you've all heard of the deal that reliance has made with facebook and 5 million of these kirana stores are just about to be digitized in fact phase 1 has begun you you would have read a couple of days ago that jio mart has already started functioning though not in the not in the same way as this is supposed to happen 5 million indian kirana stores are going to be digitized they will all be connected to you via an app if you want that famous 1 kg of sugar and say two packets of britannia biscuit all you have to do is put in the demand through that app it will go to the nearest kirana shop if he doesn't have it and go to the next one and all the shopkeeper will do is tell one of the boys cycle pakdo aur ye ja ke unko deke aa jao in other words you don't ever have to bother about shopping and driving for an hour and going to a crowded uh, bigger store can you imagine the sort of disruption it's about to cause for those people who are running larger establishments can you imagine the disruption it might cause for suppliers because now reliance has taken it upon itself to supply all these stores based on the data it will generate this is the kind of technology exploitation that causes a flutter in our lives five months ago we were all struggling to you know zoom was just another name zoom meant a bigger picture zoom was a platform which hardly anyone knew but look at what has happened in this five months suddenly we are on zoom we are on webex we are on webinar we are on hangouts team skype i haven't even named another dozen of them everybody has jumped into this void and all this is changing the shape not only of the way we work but also the way we educate ourselves but about the online platforms few of us had done a course or two on udemy or coursera but today suddenly there is a huge explosion of these and everybody is talking about education gradually moving towards the edtech route on the online route the reason i'm bringing out all this is that if you are not careful if you don't keep up then i'm afraid all this becomes disruptive the second thing that causes disruption was brought to my notice when i was a youngster in khadak wasla 1975 76 i read this book which i'm sure many of you would have read i'm very certain ram gopal would have read it because he reads all books it's there on the top left corner it says future shock by alvin toffler the crux of this book was that it is not change which disrupts you change is a constant change took place in my grandfather's time my father's time my time and it's still taking place so change doesn't bother us what is bothering us without our knowing is the fact that change is accelerating because of globalization technology many factors what used to change in 50 years began to change in 10 years 
Then it began to change in five years, even two years. So as a result, those of us who are not careful suddenly find a new reality in front of us. A bit like how my father behaved when he found a thing called internet. And he said, I don't know what it is. It's a new fangled thing. I don't want to get familiar with it. And look where, where it left his generation. So here are a couple of examples of this accelerating change that you must take note of. 40 years ago, how did you interact with each other? What was our social media? I've drawn a line here. If you look at this line from 1900 to, 19, to 2020, 1927 is the year my father was born. He's 92 now. And 58 is the year I was born. For the first about 70 years, the only way you could entertain yourself was a radio. A bigger radio, followed by a smaller radio, followed by a transistor radio, and so on and so forth. But for 70 years, that was pretty much it. Then suddenly one fine day in 70s, you got a black and white TV. And that should have lasted 70 years, right? But it didn't. In 1982, with the Asian Games, you got a color TV. In 10 years, you moved to color. And God knows in the last 30 years, how many things have come and gone. There was a thing called VCP. There was a VCR. There was a tape recorder. There was a spool tape recorder. There was a gramophone player. Where have they gone? They've just disappeared. And what was your social media? Pretty much your and my social media was, certainly my social media was, to go out in the street and talk to somebody, or go to the neighbor's house and have a chat. That was social media. Okay. And then suddenly in about 70s or so, some of us got local telephones. Remember the days you waited 10 years to get a phone, and you could only talk inside the town. In 1984, during the riots, I had to make a call from Jammu to check on my family. And I remember hanging around in a curfew in a post office for more than an hour because I booked a call. And then came a thing called STD. Remember the days about 10, 15 years ago when the entire country's landscape was full of yellow colored boats, the STD? Where have they gone? They've all been replaced by that little gizmo in your pocket, which can also do many other things, including taking pictures. So just a few years ago, we were very careful about taking pictures because it meant wasting the reel. And after you took your picture, you had to wait for 10 or 15 days to see how you looked. And now in this short period of time, you can take your picture, you can mutate it, you can change it, you can doctor it, you can do what you like, and you can ship it. And social media in the last few years has made it practically possible for you to connect to anyone in the world. Theoretically, if you want, you can write a mail to Donald Trump, though I really see no reason why anybody would do that. But you can. And the things which have taken over your life, that thing called smartphone, which has become part of your body, and WhatsApp, which is occupying all your attention, are just 10 years old. They're just 10 to 12 years old. And look what an impact they have had, not just on yourself, but on our social culture. So, you know, this is the kind of change that takes place, which we don't notice. But one fine day, we get confused. How did we ask for directions when we went to, say, a new part of Pune, or say you went to Kolapur or somewhere else? Obviously, you asked a stranger. And what did the stranger do? He gave you directions based on his best understanding of where to go and how to go. Usually, it left you more confused. Then, just a few years ago, 15 years ago, you got a thing called Google, Google Maps in your pocket. This little guy or lady tells you not only the directions, but precise timings by which you might reach, which roads are crowded, where there is a toll tax to be paid, if you are over speeding, and even talks to you. You didn't notice and I didn't notice, but in one stroke, this little gizmo replaced all the strangers of the world to whom you used to turn for directions. And how did you watch movies? You again asked a friend. The friend gave you a recommendation based on what he or she liked. And there was a caveat. The movie had to be showing, right? All that changed just four years ago. The likes of Netflix came. Not only do you have your, today you're spoiled for choice. You have Netflix, you have Prime Amazon, you have Hotstar, you have Airtel, you have God knows how many channels. But that's not only important. You watch a couple of movies on Netflix, it uses an algorithm, and then it starts recommending you the movies you might like. In one stroke, in four years, a lot of your friends have been replaced as far as your choice of movies is concerned. And this, you know, I can go on and on. These are the things which are there in so many parts of your life. The third thing, which is a very personal 
a little, I wouldn't say personal theory, but something I like to say, is the third thing that disrupts you is when you're not careful about asymmetry, especially the people in business. What it means is this. When a strong established player fights a weaker player, and if the weaker player follows the same tactics as the stronger player, which is conventional tactics, it will lose. But if the weaker player decides to follow different tactics, it will rattle the stronger player. And too many stronger players, too many businesses are not even looking in the rear view mirror for these smaller players. Let me give you three examples. People ask me many times, you know, why is it so hard for the army to finish terrorism? What is so tough? You guys are well trained. You're so many of you. You know why? Because the bloke we are fighting is not following the same rules. He doesn't wear uniform. You can't identify him. He doesn't carry an eye card. He doesn't travel in a mock vehicle. He doesn't live in a cantonment. He doesn't live in a camp. He melts with the people. He doesn't follow the law. That's why it is hard. Why is it so hard for this big business to follow, to fight unorganized sector, to startups? Because there is a different paradigm at play. Similarly, the big West countries of the West who thought globalization is going to be answer to their prayers have been surprised by Vietnam and Cambodia and Bangladesh and even say India for that matter, because we play by a different set of rules. Remember, so in your business, watch out for asymmetry and try and adapt to the tactics of the smaller player, not the other way around. The last thing is, of course, we all understand is a black swan event. Uh, this, this name came from a time when people thought the only swans in the world were white. And then in 1897, a bunch of British scientists landed up in Western Australia and they found that they were black swans. So anything that happens unusually, like 9-11, like financial crisis, like uh, coming of Internet and so on, coronavirus is called black swan. These events are unprecedented. They are very large in their impact. The question you should be asking yourself is, is it true that they are unpredictable? I'm afraid not. I think they are predictable. Because uh, coronavirus may have been unpredictable to the, to the meat market of Wuhan. It may have, might even been unpredictable to Wuhan itself or maybe parts of China. But what about the rest of us? We knew about it from January. It wasn't that unpredictable. All right. So that's the other thing you want to work for. Now we come to the lessons, the crux of the matter, three lessons. The first and the foremost lesson is if anybody tells you that in times of disruption, you can lead by words or by talks from the pulpit or talks from the stage is not a friend of yours. The army understands this. You can only lead by example. I'm going to tell you a personal story. Please hang on to it. It's a wonderful story. It's a true story. It happened on the 4th of June 1997 when I was commanding that battalion in the Kupwara area of JNK, the height of the problem. I ran into something and I got a fantastic leadership advice from my army barber. I'm going to share it. So that day, I had gone over a piece of, on a track, kacha track, and 10 minutes later, the next vehicle got blown up. There was a mine, what we call improvised explosive device under the road. The militants were sitting 200 meters away. They triggered a remote and they blew up the vehicle. How did I? They didn't blow up my vehicle. I don't know. Maybe they were there at that time. Maybe it didn't work. Whatever happened. So 10 minutes ahead, I heard a very loud bang. The vehicle went up above the eucalyptus trees. The vehicle that was following it, the driver saw it. It took two turns in the air and then it crashed against the ground. And this was its ship. It instantly killed one major and two Jawans. One young lieutenant and two Jawans were trapped in this mangled bit of steel. And they were very badly injured. They were almost paralyzed. The militants then started firing from the, uh, you know, from my, as you can see, there's jungles on one side, the hills on one side. They started firing from there, trying to kill the rest of the guys and to take away their weapons. In the meanwhile, we'd heard this bang and we turned around and we started running with our AK-47s. We were told not to take the vehicles because there could be more mines. As we were running, there was a major, uh, major day on my on one side, and my barber, a guy called Sipai Ruplal on the other side. So Major Dev told me, he said, "Sir, you know you are wearing these red colored tabs on your on your collars, which senior officers wear, colonels and above. You are not supposed to wear it in operations. 
it's against the rules because you get marked out by the enemy so please take this out because there is still firing going on and somebody is going to take a shot at you and if you get killed then there'll be another there'll be more problems so i looked at him and said okay i'll remove it but i didn't remove it immediately because we were quite flustered and we were still running we came across a vehicle which was coming from the other side which was carrying the mortal remains of the people the vehicle was flushed with blood and uh, i could see clearly that nobody could have survived then a few steps later the barber stopped me rupal tapped me and said can i have a word with you i said sure he said sir jo aapko abhi salah di major sahab ne that is a very good piece of advice and i think there's no courage and no bravery in wearing these red pants i think you should have taken them off and you should take them off because now you will get shot and in his words phir bhagal baj jayega so i said uh, yeah rupal i'm just thinking about it i think i will take them off he said but i have one more piece of advice don't take them off today in fact don't take them off for 3 months he said sir we don't want any jawan in the battalion to think that just because three people die the co gets shaken because you after all have to lead by example so you have to appear calm and cool so please don't remove them you know i thought about this when i reached this little this crater 8 feet deep and i told myself isn't this the finest advice you will get on leading by example it means you've got to lead by example no matter what the sacrifice it entails and that is exactly what the indian army officers are taught and that's what they follow and that's the reason we get we are followed blindly on the slopes of kargil all right so this is a great lesson that i think you could imbibe because in the times of disruption your teams are fearful your teams are scared your teams are wondering about their jobs they're thinking whether there'll be a job cut there'll be lack of bonus what about their children's education but if they find you holding their hand and displaying uh, example then i think things will get better what does it mean for you it means three things you've got to work harder than the people you lead and you've got to protect your team don't throw your team under the bus if you recall a time when there was a there was an incident in jnk which i will talk about maybe later again when when an officer tied a civilian on the jeep in order to save uh, there, there were people you know there were locals who were pelting stones so he tied a civilian a kashmiri on the jeep and he drove through the crowd and saved a lot of crpf boys there was a lot of criticism people went to town politicians went to town they said army is using civilians as a human shield blah 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 what did the chief of the army stop do when he went to srinagar he gave the officer a medal you got to protect your team or otherwise if you throw them under the bus you're going to cause disruption please be visible do not be locked behind a glass door with a name plate outside all good leaders understand that army officers are in the middle of action even in the olden times the kings used to come riding into the battle sitting on an elephant not a very practical way to fight a war when you are using uh, swords but you are visible it gives a calming effect to everyone else Sam Walton of uh, Walmart did the same thing. Every Saturday he was available to his entire headquarters team. He held this meeting for decades, where he spoke to his team, he took their advice, he questioned them, hundreds of them, including their families. What he was doing was being visible, right? Visibility has has a great calming effect. The third thing is, it's obvious, but before you start demanding uh, high standards from people who are already struggling. please set the highest standards for yourself when i'm saying you i don't mean you i mean you and all the leaders under you i'm talking about a culture here the second lesson the secret sauce from the army is motivation a lot of people talk about it but how do you really motivate what do you really do when there is such uncertainty the first thing you got to understand is that everybody works for self interest now uh i i don't think ram gopal mentioned this i've been ceo twice ever since i left the army i was ceo of a rural education society running 92 schools and colleges and then i was a ceo of a very successful engineering uh, pmc consultancy pmc company uh, which doubled its revenues in two years all right i am struck by the fact how wrong is the corporate sector in assuming that everybody is working only for money we have created this culture is money important sure is do i want money 
course. But money is not the only thing. If money was the only thing, you won't have army people dying on the slopes of Kargil because you get not a single Nayat Asa more for being shot at or being killed. So what is it? You know, people work for money, but people work for many other things. There are people with such loveless backgrounds who join the army or corporate sector who are looking for your recognition, who are looking for acknowledgement, who are looking for appreciation. There are other people who come there to work because that is their identity. I'm sure in your organization you will you would have seen some iconic people, some people who may be maybe cooks or waiters or maybe lift operators, you know, whose whole life is that. So try addressing people's self-interest. Listen and understand what is going on in their lives. What are their fears? What are their worries? When you are a commanding officer in the army, you've got to know all thousand of your men, not just by name, but you also have to know where are they coming from, what are their issues, what are their problems. Secondly, the most, the least expensive tool you have in your hand is appreciation. But I don't know what happens to us. I don't know what happens to us when we rise to a certain rank. We find it so hard to appreciate. We think we'll spoil people. That's not the case. I used to tell my chairman, when you're walking across the, you know, the, the, the hall, just tap one guy on his shoulder and tell him, I just heard you're doing a great job and watch his performance. He has no choice but to live up to that. And I'm not talking about false appreciation. I'm talking about appreciation because everyone deserves it. The third thing is, a lot of people moan about, you know, I don't have a great team. If I had a great team, I would have been successful. I am sorry. Then you're not facing realities of life. In 41 years that I've worn a uniform, my experience is, if you have 15% outstanding people, you are blessed. You are just blessed. Normally the stack up is 15%, that is one in six, great guys. 80% good guys who can be pushed and nudged and improved and 5% trouble creators. That's the stack up. The second part is probably the most important piece of advice I'll give this evening. You know, as leaders, we all need to correct mistakes. After all, we don't, we are not existing to create happiness only. Happiness is not the goal of leadership. Happiness is a great idea. You should have happiness, but you need to correct errors. How do you correct errors? You correct errors by understanding that all errors are not to be corrected in the same way. There are three types of errors. One is an error of judgment. So one of your team members decided to take a call. He took a decision while talking to a client or to a government official. And when he got back, you didn't like it. What are you supposed to do? You're supposed to smile at him and you're supposed to overlook it. And you're supposed to tell him, uh, all right, I think you could have done it differently, but never mind. Why am I saying this? I give you the example of the officer who tied a civilian on a jeep. What was it? It was an error of judgment. It was just a judgment. If you are not going to allow people to take their own calls, you will end up creating rabbits in your companies. You won't create tigers. And come the day of crisis and disruption, you need tigers. You need people who can take decisions. All right. So overlook the error of judgment. I sometimes say this in a funny way. You know, if uh, let's say you are not at home and a salesman turns up who's rather well dressed and you've made mistakes him for a friend and she makes him sit and gives him a cup of tea and gives him something to eat and you come back home and you realize she's made a mistake. What is it? It's an error of judgment. You have two choices. One is to go to the kitchen and say, Ye paise ped pe hai? that you are giving tea and biscuits to this damn salesman. Don't you have any brains? Or there's another way of doing and saying, smiling and saying, Oh, what is the difference? The difference is, if you take the first approach, believe me, the day your boss comes home suddenly or your uncle comes home, he's not getting any, he's not getting any tea. Your maid is going to wait for you. Okay, because you've killed all initiative. So watch out for the errors of judgment. Second are the errors which are in bulk, in the army, in the corporate sector. Errors of omission, errors of laziness. They need to be corrected. People need to be pulled up once, twice, trained, given a briefing, given a memo. And if somebody doesn't improve, then of course, shown the door. These are errors of laziness. The third are errors of intention, where people purposely do things. They are never to be forgiven. 
if somebody tries making money in the army or you know fooling around with somebody else's woman he is going out of the army without pension you do not forgive errors of intention somebody who does things against your organization so please make this distinction from today errors of judgment overlook errors of laziness improve errors of intention punish all right we come to almost the end of it but here is another thing in the times of disruption even in other times there is a big problem in companies companies like yours the fact that individuals don't feel acknowledged they don't feel recognized they are just a name on the salary slip okay it's impossible for a boss after all to know you know mr prem ji can't know every employee of wipro obvious uh, not even in smaller companies people can know uh, everybody who works there so how do you motivate these people if that was a fact how does a million strong army behave there is a secret nobody in the army is dying for general bali or the chief or india's fluttering flag all right the people in the army die for the unit they die because we have created small units which are led by young leaders or managers in your case who are given so much importance that that man makes it his, his sole job to look after his team to project its interest to protect them and so on and so forth right to any cantonment you see some boards there which say on certain roads it says uh, flag cars and co's cars only a co's only a colonel but the army recognizes that a unit commander is a very important man he is actually god okay there are there are very senior officers sitting in the crowd i know in the audience like brigadier apte they know it that a commanding officer is a god almighty that is what you need to do you got to empower your small units your vertical heads your smaller teams within your administration or hr or recruitment or operations or business development or what have you marketing whatever and listen to those guys empower them praise them publicly show people that they are important talk to them every now and then they are the guys who will take care of their teams and together they will sew a fabric which will make your organization strong lastly you must create a ecosystem where your company your organization can take risks how said that the army is forever looking for risk we understand you can't win without risk you can't shun risk you can't you can't say i will you know i'll be on status quo it is because we have created sops procedures in every tradition which allows us to take a risk for example let's say if that day in the operation that i talked about i had got shot let's say the next senior man was a havaldar what would have happened the havaldar would have stepped into my place no succession plan required so if everybody in the army is willing to step into the next job when there is a problem how can you defeat this army that's the kind of sop tradition and norm you need to create what army understands about virtual environment in which you are working today and everybody is working is that you require more leadership more structure more procedures more communication and more recognition not less you need to redouble your efforts because not teams are sitting far away they are as it is anxious and uncertain and you can't look at their body language you don't know what they are thinking so please enforce this this is a, this is a good audit to do in your company this is a great audit to do to improve productivity as to how you dealing with the virtual environment you deal with virtual environment also with clarity of instructions i don't want you to read this busy slide i have just given these as, as examples as you move into virtual environment please set clear protocols don't don't let people decide protocols on their own and then get confused what time are they supposed to log on how long are they supposed to work are they supposed to take breaks what happens if the network goes down how quickly are they supposed to answer emails what do people do who are in client facing roles when they are sitting when they are working remotely what do they do lay down the protocol and also lay down a clear command and control do you have a morning interaction with everyone where you look at everybody's face do you have an end of the day summing up do you have some joint meetings though my personal recommendation is keep these meetings to the bare minimum because there is nothing that wastes time more in the corporate sector 
than just having endless meetings. We have a meeting, we have a clear agenda. Don't tell every man jack to come and sit down. Have a clear agenda, have a clear set of attendance. And then, of course, whatever work is given, please make it measurable. Now, these are just examples. I, I spoke to Infosys yesterday and I gave them many more examples of the same kind because they are really affected by it. The fact of the matter is, you need more clarity of instructions and more leadership now. Last part of this talk is that you need to learn that you can overcome disruption only when you have a process driven culture like the army has. Everything in the army is process driven. What does the army do? It does perpetual rec reconnaissance and surveillance of the enemy. It uses every mean at its disposal. It uses the eyes, it does patrolling, it uses infrared, it uses thermal imaging, satellite pictures, pictures from the aircraft, you name it. The idea is to locate every threat and every opportunity. And that is precisely what you should be doing now. Are you looking for threats enough? I sometimes get the impression that we are underestimating the threats of the near future and overestimating the threats of the future beyond. We are not taking the present threats as seriously, but we are too worried about the future threats, which may or may not, I feel, may or may not come true. And then, please plan for your opportunities. And when you do that, remember that army does not use the maps of, say, Nagaland to carry out, uh, you know, reconnaissance or navigation in Rajasthan. But too many people today are using, uh, if I may use a strong word, rubbish sources from WhatsApp to develop their perspective. So, after this talk, please review the sources of your information. What is it that makes you fearful? What are you reading? Are you listening to Bill Gates, Raghuram Rajan, Koshik Basu? Are you reading the Hindu, the Indian Express? What are you reading? Or are you going to the channels which are shouting at each other? And that's your source of information. Do look at what could go wrong if your company or in your personal life you continue down this road after the coronavirus? Whether it is term of company culture, health, money, your cash flow, relationships, or your the way you spend your time. And do work on these opportunities with a sense of urgency. I can't use this word with more emphasis. Urgency. That is what you need to do. And the last part is what I call embed a sense and response in your system. What does it mean? I'll quickly tell you a little case study. You know, in 2000, in the month of March, this case study is called Nokia versus Ericsson. There was a lightning that struck the, uh, the plant of Royal Phillips in Albuquerque, New Mexico. When the lightning struck, there was a little fire, not much, 10 minutes of fire. And after that, everything became all right. And Philips assured Nokia and Ericsson, for which they used to make microchips, that things are going to be all right in one week. Ericsson stayed on status quo. They said, fine. If Philips says so, that's the template, it'll be fine. But Nokia didn't do that. Nokia set up three teams. One, to work with Philips to make sure that they could make those chips elsewhere. Second, to start redesigning their chips. And third, to start sourcing their chips elsewhere. And what happened at the end of the year? Ericsson suffered a loss of $1.6 billion. And Nokia turned a profit of 42% at the end of his third quarter. I'm talking about March and then his third quarter. Okay. So I think what you need to do in your companies and your organizations is you want to change the culture into a sense and response, a collaborative culture where people don't sit and let the grass grow. Next is the army makes actionable plans, but more importantly, it makes contingencies. So, like I said, develop a good perspective. Please remember that the plans you make in your personal life or for your organizations are no plans if they don't include timelines, the amount of sacrifice you're going to make, by what day will you finish, and so on and so forth. And you must have contingencies. Those of you who dealt with the army know that the army has a contingency, a plan B and C for everything, including for dinners. We would have a contingency plan for a dinner. You might laugh at it. Okay. But it works. Today, you uh, need contingencies for a lot of stuff. Alternative source of material, even workforce. What if people don't come back? 
all this workforce that has gone to Bihar and UP. How are you going to think about your just in time lean inventories? Because now with pandemics and stuff like that happening, you may need inventories. You don't want to exhaust them. What about third party logistics? Do you need more than one? Instead of, do you need a full model of supply chain where you bring raw material from elsewhere to you rather than waiting for it? Do you need alternative methods of supply to the end users like, say, Reliance is done by taking on excess uh, resources of Swiggy and Zomato and delivering uh, groceries? What about work from home? What about connectedness with customers in such circumstances? And so on and so forth. We come to the last part, the last thing which you've got to learn from the army. Now, I know everybody in the corporate sector believes in having some reserves, but that's not enough. The army believes that you need to have reserves, but then you need to keep recreating those reserves so that in any disruption, you're not taken by surprise. There is a map which I've drawn. There is a line of control or border. There's the enemy. And one company of enemy is going to be attacked by three companies of infantry, our infantry, Alpha, Bravo, and Charlie. Typically, the tactics goes, Alpha and Bravo will attack, and the commander will always have Charlie company in reserve. Let us say the attack begins and Alpha Company gets mauled. Some people die. What happens then? Then the commander pulls back the remaining Alpha Company and pushes Charlie into the attack. It recreates the reserves. So while you may have reserves, please see that every step of the way, you continue to recreate reserves, whether you take loans or whatever you do, how you create it. I mean, you are more inventive than I am, but you must have reserves. This pretty much brings us to the end. I'm going to end with two very remarkable statements. The first is proven uh, by me to be my own self for all my life. Your fears are the worst lives. Thank you, General Bali, for that session. Uh, I would like to uh, check on uh, Brigadier Apte now, if he would like to uh, take up the closing remarks, please. <laughs>